uh, from the Lord on this morning. And I'm going to call your attention to the 40th chapter of Isaiah, as you can see on the front of your program. Uh, it says Isaiah 40. Uh, it does not mention any verses. I'll be preaching from the entirety of chapter 40. But I will not be reading all 31 verses. Amen. But just want to use the entire 40th chapter uh, as context. I want to read a few select verses. I'm going to read verses 12, 13, and 14. Uh, then I'm going to jump to 18. I know it'll be hard for you to remember this, so I'll repeat. Uh, then I'll go to 25, 27, and 28. Beginning in Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, calculated the dust of the earth by measure, and weighed the mountains and the balance and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or has his counselor, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Verse 18. To whom then will you liken your God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, that I will be his equal, says the Holy One. Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, creator of the end of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. God, allow me to speak faithfully. Allow your people to hear clearly. Allow yourself to receive all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to talk about a Q&A with Isaiah. Uh, as you'll note, the selected verses that I shared uh, from the latter part of the 40th chapter, uh, they all were formed, uh, phrased in the form of a question. And what we'll notice, my brothers and sisters, in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah is almost having a monologue with himself. And in his monologue with himself, he is offering comfort, dispelling doubt, and also giving some answers to an inquiring nation, that being the nation of Israel. And Isaiah, in this monologue, he poses some questions that he already knows the answers to. But he also poses some questions that he knows that in the hearts and the minds of those whom God has called him to prophetically speak to. So we have a Q&A with Isaiah. For those who have been keeping count, as you know, we embarked on a series entitled E100, of Grasping the Big Picture of God's Word, and we are now on sermon number 46 out of 100. Uh, we'll have about three or four more sermons to complete our Old Testament text, and then we will have 50 sermons from the New Testament. But essentially, my brothers and sisters, we want to see a big picture of the Bible, a panoramic view of the Word of God, in order that we might see through the lives of the individual characters God's plan unfolding. Now, we've not gone through every verse and every chapter, but we've selected certain texts in order that you might see through the lives of these biblical characters the panoramic view of God's plan. And please understand, as we understand and as we see God's plan unfolding, we begin to see not only the contributions of the lives of the biblical characters, but we also see what God is doing in our life. Because if we understand that we are but mere individuals whom God is using to unfold a grand master plan, and when we understand that God's plan is going to come to fruition, it will help us to understand that no matter what we go through, no matter what we may be experiencing, God's promise is going to come 
to pass. Been through the Pentateuch, the first uh, five books of the Bible. We've been through the historical literature, 12 books. We've been through the wisdom books and the Psalms, five. And now we enter into the latter part of the Old Testament, the book of the prophets. There are literally 12. You'll find five uh, major prophets and the rest being minor prophets. Nothing to do with the significance of their ministry, but literally with the extent of their writings. And what we glean, my brothers and sisters, from the prophets is that God responds to small steps in the right direction. And we need to understand when we embark and read from Isaiah and the other prophets, and please understand that Jesus even said that it only takes a faith the size of a mustard seed. God will respond to small steps as long as they are in the right direction. Prophets also help us to see that God patiently calls his people to return to him and understand that God's plan has not changed. God is patiently forbearing with his people to turn to him. The Bible also helps us to understand that we don't need to be alarmist when the 5 o'clock and the 6 o'clock and the 6.30 and the 9 o'clock and the 10 o'clock and the 11 o'clock news come on. Because the prophets remind us that rulers and empires are a part of God's choreography of history. In other words, God is in control. The prophets remind us that God responds to trust, even to a remnant. It does not, it does not take a mega, just take one somebody to believe in God, and God will respond. The prophets remind us that God's plan spans the entire scope of history. When we look at the prophet, the prophet is one who proclaims the divine plan of God in all of its fullness. Too many times we have an imbalanced approach to prophets and prophecy because we limit prophecy to future things. But prophets do not only deal with the future, prophets deal with the reality of the word of God in the present. Isaiah was not only dealing with the future, Isaiah was warning about what God was going to do right now. The voice of the prophet is not only for tomorrow, but the voice of the prophet is for today. So prophecy should be seen as a proclamation of God's plan rather than a prediction of the future. We understand that prophecy moves or dales into the revealing of God and also God's plan. Prophets can be divided into three categories. Isaiah and others might be considered pre-exilic prophets, those who were prophesying and warning the children of Israel prior to going into Babylonian captivity. Then there was a section of prophets called the exilic prophets, those who prophesied and offered encouragement while they were in Babylon. And then there were post-exile prophets who, who were encouraging the people of God when they were being restored. And so those before had a message of warning. Those during had a message of encouragement. And those after had a message of restoration. Prophets often arose during times of crisis and time of need. And my brothers and sisters, I'm like Marvin and Nickel. I wonder where have all the prophets gone? Because we are in a time of crisis and a time of need even today. But nobody wants to give a prophetic warning to a nation that has turned its back on God. Prophets, they were social commentators. From a biblical worldview and from God's standpoint and from thus saith the Lord, the prophets were giving social commentary on the things that were transpiring every day, beginning at about 5 o'clock on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. We have the likes of Anderson Cooper, Al Sharpton, Bill O'Reilly, social commentators, who were giving a political perspective on social happenings. But the prophets were not giving political commentary on society. They were giving God's viewpoint on what's going on. And if we don't turn back to God, it ain't about battle, about vote. It's about a God. Oh, Lord, have mercy today. Who 
holds all things in his hand. To give a good illustration of a prophet, imagine a college professor preparing a syllabus, and on the very first day of the class, the college professor, Dr. Norwood, does not go into the first class, but the college professor sends a student assistant with his or her syllabus and has that student assistant read out to the class the syllabus or the plan that will unfold over the course of the semester. In that particular case, the student assistant is serving as a mouthpiece or a spokesman or a prophet for the college professor. They are literally unfolding the plan of the one who has developed the plan. And then when the professor comes on the scene, those who are in the class begin to realize that the plan unfolds just as the professor says they will unfold. And so when we read the Bible in all of its panoramic view, we understand that God is the primary character in the plot line. God is unfolding his plan. But the biblical characters are mere characters in the story land of a most high and a most wonderful God. The book of Isaiah my brothers and sisters, can be divided into two sections. Verses 1 through 39 deal with the darkness of judgment. And when we move into Isaiah chapter 40, we see the words, comfort ye, comfort me, my people, because when we transition from chapter 39 to chapter 40, we are stepping out of the darkness of judgment into the light of salvation. Book of Isaiah, according to Warren Wiersbe, can be called a Bible in miniature. If you'll look at the book of Isaiah, you'll notice that Isaiah has 66 chapters. There are 66 chapters in the Bible. You'll notice that Isaiah is conveniently divided between the first 39 chapters. There are 39 chapters in the Old Testament. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah deal with God's judgment on sin, very equivalent to the Old Testament 39 books. The remaining 27 chapters of Isaiah equivalent to the 27 books of the New Testament talk about the grace of God. My brothers and sisters, Isaiah would have us to understand that God is greater than our circumstances. Isaiah would want us to understand that God is greater than the circumstances behind us. From chapter 39 back to chapter 1, we begin to see the circumstances behind them. And when the children of Israel see what has taken place in their past, how they have fallen short from what God expects from them, they are grieving and they are lamenting. And when we are grieving and lamenting, what do we want? We want comfort. So the Bible has not literally Isaiah speaking, but God speaking to Isaiah, saying, Isaiah, my people need comfort. But that comfort can only come from me. Isaiah would tell us that God is greater than the circumstances behind us. But God would also tell us in Isaiah that God is greater than the circumstances before us as they look at the reclamation project, not of any physical buildings, but of their spiritual state. They have to understand that God is able to put things back together again. My brothers and sisters, circumstances are those nasty things that you see when you take your eyes off God. But if you look at God through your, if you look at God through your circumstances, God will seem small and far away. But Isaiah would tell you, but if you by faith look at your circumstances through God, and God will seem very near and very capable. My brothers and sisters, Isaiah would want us to understand that if we're going to get right with God, we've got to start from the right place and know where God's plan is unfolding. That's my brothers and sisters why I'm taking a such time to walk us all the way through the Bible. Because my brothers and sisters, if we don't know God's plan and how God's plan is unfolding, we will misinterpret and mis misapply the word of God. Because once we know God's plan, the application and the interpretation are not left up to us, but they are unfolded by the plan of God. In other words, we preach, we interpret, we teach, we understand the word of God based on 
what God is doing and not what we want in our lives. The best way I can explain it is this. Any of us that go to the airport to catch a flight, we are clear about certain things. Prior to the airport, we're clear about our destination. We're very clear about our flight number. We're very clear about our time of departure. But until we actually check in, we're not actually sure always about our gate number. Now, you can have your destination. You can have your flight number. You can have your time of departure. But if you go to the wrong gate, you won't make it to the right destination. And too often times, the prophet would warn us that because we don't start at the right gate, because we don't start with God, because we put our reliance someplace else, we will not arrive at the destination, my brothers and sisters, that God would ultimately have for us. The prophets as social commentators would warn us that we as a people, not just the children of Israel, we are always unfaithful to God. We tend to oppress the defenseless. We tend to devalue deity. We put misplaced reliance in the wrong objects and then we wind up confusing our priorities. Isaiah tells us in the very beginning of the text something about comfort that comes from God. And the comfort that comes from God or God the comforter, my brothers and sisters, helps us to understand there are some conditions that must be met before God would comfort us. There are some methods that only God will use in order to comfort us. And whenever we follow God's conditions and methods in order to be comforted, then God's proven results will certainly come to pass. Isaiah chapter 40 is one of the most eloquent and moving chapters of the Bible. And as it moves forward, it not only talks about God the comforter, but in verse 3, it talks about God the promise maker. And when he talks about God the promise maker, the writer helps us understand in verse 3 that in order, my brothers and sisters, to receive comfort, there's only one way. The writer says, do not, do, do not, do not clear the past, but clear the past. Yes. That verse 3 says that, that if you're lamenting over your past, there's not a path, plural, but there's only one path to get comfort. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 40 is the gospel in miniature. Isaiah helps us to understand that whenever we cry out to God, God will comfort us, but then God will also tell us there's only one way to get the comfort that you need. But whenever we do God things the way that God wants us to do them, God's promises are certainly sure. And the promises of God, Isaiah would tell us, are conditional and unconditional. It's a good thing that most of the promises of God are unconditional promises when it stems or talks about our salvation and our restoration. The promises of God are best illustrated by telling the story of two girls. One girl had five pennies in, the, in her hand, and her friend or classmate asked her, how many pennies do you have? The little girl said, I have ten pennies. The friend said, open your hand again. She counted one, two, three, four, five. She said, you don't have ten pennies, you have five pennies. The little girl said, no, I have ten pennies. My daddy said when he gets home, he's going to give me five more pennies. And what the little girl was illustrating is that the promises of your dad, the promises of your father are promises that you can bank on. And Isaiah is saying that God's promise of warning, God's promise of judgment, and God's promise of restoration are promises that you and I can bank on. But then Isaiah moves forward in verse 10 to talk about God being not only the good shepherd, but the one who has great strength. Verse 10 says that he's a God who has strong arm. But then it says in verse 11, he's also the God who will gather you up in his arm. That illustrates my brothers and sisters and prophetically speaks to the work of Jesus Christ to restore us. He came to the earth with a strong arm to redeem and deliver us from the power of sin, the power of death, and the power of the enemy. And once he redeemed us with his strong arm from the power of death, the power of sin, and the power of the enemy, he took us in his arm. And he yet cradles us each and every day, nourishing us, sustaining us, and keeping us. So then after Isaiah 
gives this explanation of who God is. Isaiah begins to formulate some questions that he thinks that many will ask as it relates to the sufficiency of God. Isaiah has literally given a lecture on who God is. And then at the end of his lecture, he opens it up for some Q&A, some questions and some answers. Isaiah said, who has measured the waters in the hollow of their hand? He knows, my brothers and sisters, that many folk cannot grasp who God is and cannot experience the restoration and salvation of God because they don't understand the wisdom in the mind of God. But it's not up to us to understand the wisdom in the mind of God, nor is it up to us, as he says in verses 13 and 14 and 18, to understand the ways of God and what God is doing. My brothers and sisters, Isaiah asked a number of questions rhetorically that Isaiah already knows the answers to. Because Isaiah would want us to understand, my brothers and sisters, that God's ways are not our ways. And God's thoughts are not our thoughts. The message of God is best summar summarized when we think about God's work. The museum guide took a tour group to a darkened room, and it was a part of the tour guide's regular uh, tour. He would take them to a darkened room, and in that darkened room, he would shine a light on a mass of string, of color, and it appeared to apparently be in chaos. And he would ask the group, what do you see? And inevitably, the group would say, we see chaos. We see things that don't make any sense. Literally, we do not know. And then the tour guide would tell them all to go stand on the other side of the room. And he said, he would tell them to watch. And when he would tell them to watch, he would reach up and he would turn on a spotlight. When he turned on the spotlight, it was instantly apparent that the mass of jumbled colors that they thought didn't make any sense all of a sudden became an enormous and a beautiful tapestry. From the back side, they could see what it was all about when the spotlight was shined on. My brothers and sisters, the real work had to be seen from a different perspective. The prophets wanted the people of God and for us to understand, we cannot understand or fathom what God is doing or what the artist of the universe is creating in our lives. But with God, we realize his ways are not our ways. After we look and we ask why and how, it's not because there is no purpose. Because we realize that what God is doing can only be understood from the lens of eternity. We cannot understand what God is doing from our temporal perspective. The prophet tells us we can only understand by realizing that God is a God whose brow does not bend at the nod of temporal questions. But God is a God who works outside of time in eternity to bring about and unfold his plan for the people of God. Isaiah prophesied 800 years prior to the coming of Christ during a time of crisis and need. And Isaiah prophetically in chapter 7 and chapter 9 tells us there will be a virgin birth. There will be a sinless life. There will be a suffering servant who will be bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace will be upon him and by his stripes we shall be restored. My brothers and sisters, you may be in need of comfort today as we extend the invitation to Christian discipleship. As the deacons are coming, we want you to understand that God is the one who can dispel your doubts and fears. As you come to Jesus, just as you are weary, wounded, and sad, you'll find in him a resting place, and he will make you glad. If you'll stand all over the building, and we implore and invite you to come, come to Jesus during this invitation period. This is an invitation for those who have never entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know for sure that you've never come forward, you've never given your hand and your heart to Christ in salvation and follow him in baptism. We beseech you to come today while the blood is yet running warm in your veins. No man knows the day or nor the hour when he will come back. So we implore you to come today. If you are redeemed, you know for sure that you know that if you were to die tonight, that you would wake up in the arms of the Lord. 
He wants you to know that if you know you're redeemed without a church home, we invite you to come today as well. Come to Jesus.